Welcome. Welcome to the 24th anniversary breakfast of Real Change. My name is Malu Chavez and I've been a board member of Real Change since 2015. We have all come together this morning to celebrate the compelling journalism, dedicated advocacy, and the inspiring hard work of the Real Change vendors. <laughs> Thank you for being here this morning. The theme of the breakfast this year is myth busting. We're all aware of the current political climate and how truth is valued. But also everyday people make assumptions about the way our city works and who our neighbors are based on misconceptions. As you walked into the breakfast this morning, no doubt you saw the structure created by our friends at the American Institute of Architects who showcased this project at the Seattle Design Fest last weekend. This structure shares the faces and stories and statistics that show the just how multifaceted the issue of homelessness, homelessness in our city is. And at each table, our Change Agent Award winner, Susan Russell, has placed a heart handmade by another person for you to take home. And this is from her Love Wins Love Project, which you'll hear more about later on. Also on your tables, you'll find a copy of the Emerald City Resource Guide. This pocket-sized portal to change lists services like meals, shelters, and culturally specific resources to put the power of change in people's pockets. 45,000 copies were published the first run. And we plan to publish biannually to keep this guidebook up to date. Our sponsors and community funders made this possible. If you want to get involved and bring this valuable resource to our streets, please let us know. This morning, open your mind to a possibility for change and open your hearts to the people you're sharing a table with. Let's bust some myths together. <laughs> The real change vendors work hard, selling the paper rain or shine, working to keep our community informed on the issues that matter through this award-winning newspaper. Let's take a moment to honor these over 700 individuals who work very hard every day to create connections across class boundaries, bring Seattle the news, and inspire every one of us. Real Change Active members, please stand up and join me in thanking these vendors for their work. also ask my fellow board of directors to stand and the vendor advisory board thank you for your service <clears throat> also with us this morning are a number of elected officials from the city and county who help shape the dialogue around homelessness and advocate for fair policy and budget decisions. As more decision makers know, care about, and are inspired by our community, we make strides together to make Seattle a more caring and inclusive place. If you're an elected official, please stand, and please join me in thanking our elected officials who have joined us this morning. <clears throat> Um, 
We have quite a few. Uh, County Council Member Jean Noel Wells, City Council Member Teresa Mosqueda, City Council Member Mike O'Brien, City Council Member Sama Sawant, King County Assessor John Wilson, and there may be others. <laughs> Many of you are here, and this room is so full this morning because of our incredible table captains, dedicated volunteers who've brought together friends, family, and community to celebrate real change. Please join me in thanking our table captains. Thanks to our incredible sponsors, the costs associated with this event have been covered. And all donations made this morning will go directly to the programs and services provided by Real Change. Please join me in thanking our sponsors listed above, you'll see. <laughs> Our matching sponsor this morning is the Lucky Seven Foundation. Their generous contribution will match gifts $250 and up this morning. And donors who contribute to that level will also receive a copy of our keynote speaker, Nick Licata's book, Becoming a Citizen Activist, and a Real Change t-shirt like the one I'm wearing right now. Thank you to Sasquatch Books for making this possible. And now I'd like to introduce a face familiar to many here. Kate is a longtime Real Change volunteer who joined our staff this year. Please join me in welcoming Real Change volunteer coordinator Katie Comboy. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming bright and early. Well, this morning, I am honored to recognize the volunteers who so graciously dedicate their time and their talents to real change. In 2017, more than 315 volunteers served over 8,000 hours in 2017 alone, and today is no exception, as 17 volunteers arrived at 6.30 a.m. to help make today a success. Please join me in giving these volunteers a huge round of applause. You guys are amazing. And one of those volunteers is another very familiar face to many of us, Jen Romo, a longtime Real Change staff member, is here once again to support our breakfast, but this time as a volunteer. Thank you so much, Jen, for your years of service. It is now my honor to recognize two of our volunteers, our 2018 Volunteers of the Year, Jen Tibbetts and Kevin Jones. On my first day at Real Change, Jen Tibbetts was already showing me the ropes, and I will admit that I have not stopped needing her help since that day. Uh, it did not take me long to realize that Jen is someone who everyone can count on. She came to Real Change in 2014 as a vendor and has been described by staff as being all about the Real Change mission since day one. As a vendor, she excelled not only in her newspaper sales, but as a leader. So it was no surprise to anyone around her when in addition to being a vendor, she became a volunteer and an invaluable one at that. Jen has volunteered more than 315 hours of her free time to real change this year alone. And let's not forget everyone, it's only September. So knowing Jen, I think she's looking to add another 100 or so hours to that by Christmas. What do you think, Christmas? Sure. Got it. She never hesitates to help anyone with any project, no matter how big or how small, and she does it all with an infectious laugh. She's a vendor, she's a volunteer, and she's an author in our newspaper. She's a real change triple threat. Jen, it is my privilege to present you with the award for 2018 Volunteer of the Year. A 
unfortunately, Kevin couldn't be here this morning. However, if you would ever like to congratulate him in person, I can guarantee where you will find him every Saturday morning at the Real Change office selling vendors their newspapers. After moving to Seattle, Kevin began buying a Real Change newspaper every week from his local vendor, Gary. In one of those issues released almost four and a half years ago, he noticed that there was an ad looking for Real Change vendors. And as he says, I apologize, Real Change volunteers, although he could do it all. Uh, and as he says, the rest is history. Since then, every Saturday morning, you could set your watch by Kevin Jones. 10 minutes before his 8 a.m. shift, he's waiting at our sales desk to greet vendors that he says keep him coming back. Please join me in giving a round of applause in Kevin's honor. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce our fearless leader, Tim Harris. As, as the founding director of Real Change, Tim has been active as a poor people's organizer for three decades. He has received the Political Genius Award from The Stranger and is on the board of directors for the International Network of Street Papers. Please join me in welcoming Tim Harris. Good morning, everybody. If you were perhaps hoping for a long speech from me, <laughs> this isn't the morning. You'll have to uh, come back next year for our 25th anniversary. I'll deliver then. Uh, every year, when I stand up here and look at this room, I am simply overwhelmed with gratitude for our amazing vendors who show us day after day what courage looks like, who are out there taking risks, extending themselves, and building what you see here in this room, for our Real Change board, staff, and volunteers who are here to put the vendors first, help them be their best selves. And finally, I am grateful for all of our readers and supporters and allies who come together as a community of caring. This morning, I am honored to introduce two people, a vendor and an advocate, who inspire us with their courage, tenacity, and heart-led service, and because of that, are the recipients of our 2018 Change Agent Award. Those two people are Karina O'Malley and Susan Russell. Why don't you begin making your way up here? Karina O'Malley is a co-founder of Sophia Way and an instigator of the Lake Washington United Methodist Safe Parking Program. I'm honored to have first met Karina back in the 80s when we tried to get arrested in Joe Kennedy's office and failed. <laughs> Since then, Karina has kept trying. Since she helped start Sophia Way in 2012, more than 3,000 people on the east side have found the low barrier services that they need. The safe, there's more. <laughs> The safe parking program at her Kirkland Church is a model of committed community engagement. Karina's work is an example of what one person backed by a community can bring into being. Susan Russell is what love in action looks like. When life broke Susan and left her living under the Fremont Bridge, she found her way back through the caring community that is real change. When the numbers of unsheltered people kept going up year after year, Susan took her broken heart and asked others to join her. The Unity Flag Project she started, come on up here, what the fuck, come on. You too, Karina. The Unity Flag Project that she started with Fremont artist Denise Fredrickson has offered testament to the suffering on our streets and that love is the answer. 
Susan says her message to all those people still outside on the streets tonight comes down to this. We love you. We see you. Please join us this morning in honoring Susan and Karina from all of us here. We love you. We see you. Thank you. I am an incredibly unlikely change agent. But if you can take anything from my receiving this incredible honor today, is that you are now on notice that you can be a change agent too. <laughs> it doesn't have to be risky or scary or bold or even particularly creative. The folks at my church, who some of them are here, thank you so much, could see that our parking lot was empty and could be useful to people living in their cars. We built that into an incredibly beautiful community of about 50 housed volunteers and about 50 folks living in their cars, living and learning side by side, knitting together, cooking together, and just being in relationship. The people of Sophia Way, also some of them are here, past and present staff and volunteers, saw that our dollars and our time and our talent and our empty church basements could become a full service nonprofit, pretty much out of nothing into serving over 3,000 women. Thank you so much to the people of the Sophia Way who do that work every day and build those relationships. So. <laughs> Here's my best piece of advice for you. And I got this from Anitra. Be part of someone else's story. Pick a person and be part of their story. Be a friend, be useful, be there, and let them be part of your story. And you'll both be better for it. Thank you. Good morning, Seattle. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for, for coming here to support a wonderful organization. If it wasn't for real change, I wouldn't be here. I would not be here. They were the platform that made all of this possible. Um, Tim Harris, <laughs> I love you. You know, you gave us opportunity when there was no opportunity for us. Because you see, without an address, you cannot get a job. And it's even worse now, because you got to be online. <laughs> um, Denise Henriksen, my co-conspirator, I just want to thank you so much for stepping outside of your comfort zone and tracking me down and giving me an opportunity to be connected to art again. I, I you know, <laughs> um, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy for me to, to be here. You know, I, it, it was 10 years <laughs> for permanent housing. So, um, Serena, Susanna, Woo! My soul sisters, you know, um, I just want to thank um, my, my, my team. You all know who you are. Um, you know, can we hold our hearts up? Woo! We have made about 6,000 of these, which, you know, our numbers, our homeless numbers are about there. So, over there. So, just know you're, you know, we're wearing someone else's heart and someone else is wearing ours. Um, you can find Love Wins Love on Facebook, you know, and you can see what we're doing and come join us. Just know 
that Love Wins Love has evolved into Echo Thrive Housing, so the best chapter is still unwritten. So thank you very much for everything. <laughs> Woo! Change agent! <laughs> Thank you and congratulations to Karina and Susan. Woo! I am honored now to introduce the new vendor program manager, Alexis Lopez. Woo! There you are. <laughs> Hello. It'll take me a sec to get my glasses out. <laughs> it's a lot of people. Thank God for scripts. Thank you, Malou. Each year, Real Change vendors vote on two outstanding vendors to receive the Vendors of the Year, um, Year Award from a group of nominees that represent the Real Change values of courage, community, creativity, compassion, and integrity. This year, the nominees truly each bring something special and unique to the Vendor Center every day. It has been an honor working with each of these vendors and getting to know them. 2018 Vendor of the Year nominees, please stand as I read your name. Blanca Aguilera. Where's Blanca? Yamani Berge. And Harlan Wood. Please join me in another round of applause for all three of our nominees. And now the winners of the Vendor of the Year Award for 2018 are two incredible vendors who are leaders in our community and who work hard to exemplify the real change values. George Sidwell and Sabina Lopez. Here's Sabina. <laughs> They have overcome obstacles to be where they are today and to give back to the community through their service and support. Here are the winners to tell a little more of their stories in a video created by in, uh, by in kind sponsor Gunther Creative. Being vendor of the year is it's a very special privilege to me that um, my colleagues see enough in me that they feel that I could have a reward like that. I had some strokes, which uh, took away my business because I couldn't do it no more. I was in construction. My insurance canceled me because of all the bills that were coming in because I had to go into rehab, learn how to rewalk. And when I got out of rehab, about six weeks later, my house burned down. And uh, because of not having uh, any money coming in, I didn't have money for insurance. So it made me homeless. And I was pretty broken. My spirit was gone. And so when my friend was telling me about real change, it seemed like it might be something that, you know, could at least help me, you know, keep my dignity that I had left. I made some really close friends out of, out of my clients, um, which give me my spirit back and has helped me stand as a person and a human being. I'm on the vendor advisory board. Then I'm also on the homeless speakers bureau. We go out and tell our story. It was really scary at first. Sometimes, you know, it really gets emotional because uh, it's like I'm almost there again. But I like it, you know, um, and a lot of people seem to enjoy when I do speak. So, um, at least that's what I'm told. <laughs> I 
know how it, how it feels to be hungry and not have nothing. Well, I'm able to have money every day now. Um, so I'm able to eat. It gives me more confidence to be out here. It helps my, my mentality. And so I'm able to stay stable. I'm occupied all day with my time. I meet a whole bunch of other people. So that makes me very happy. But my hope for the dreams is that if I can get, get somebody can help me get into a place, into an apartment, that with the money that I do make from real change, I'm able to afford my own apartment. Because I make over a thousand a month. And I will be able to um, afford my own place and take care of myself. And then I'll be able to cook for everybody, which is really exciting. I love Fremont. There's um, so many really friendly people here. I know a lot of the homeless community. And every, I'm, never, I'm never alone up there in that corner. So everybody's always coming up to visit or just even say hello, to stop and talk, or whatever's going on throughout their life, which I'm always there for to listen. To make everybody smile. To make sure that everybody knows that they're loved and feel special. World Change is a great opportunity for anybody that needs help, that needs a job, or just looking, just looking to get out, out of the street life. That it's a great opportunity. To, it helps change lives. It changed my life. I thank the guy who started this, Tim Harris. Right? Thank you, Tim Harris. This is an awesome thing. Let's have another round of applause for these two. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Well, I just want to thank everybody for being here today. And first, I would like to thank Tim Harris for um, starting Real Change because it's meant a lot to me and helped me get through um, a lot of parts of my life and able to accomplish so much and have lots of money. <laughs> and also, have to thank Rex. He started facing homelessness. And yeah. he's, um, he's helped me get, uh, um, he's a really good friend. And it's helped me get a lot, um, been a part of my life, and it's helped me get through a lot of the bad parts of my life. So thank you, Rex, if you're here. <laughs> um, okay. Um, thanks, and thanks to all my customers who's been there to support me. And Joan is here. She's one of my customers. Thank you, Joan, for being here. <laughs> so I've been, what? Uh, that's years ago. I've been mean, working for the last four years at Real Change, and I've had an apartment, but since the rent's so high, I'm like, still homeless, still. Wasn't able, wasn't able to um, keep it. Um, I've been able to like to, um, to get food and be able to share with everybody in Fremont and give um, back to the community, and it gave me hope in my life. Um, thinking back on the first day I was selling Real Change, I was very nervous. I thought it was like panhandling, but it's not. I didn't know if I was, would be able to do it, but it's a real job. Like, you know, we have to be there if we, when we choose to, but um, we have certain hours, you know, hours that we go there. So it's like almost like a nine to five job, and we had to be, you know, be committed to it. Um, but uh, Real Change, um, a lot of people like the paper. When it, when it was a dollar and now it's two, people didn't mind and they still like purchase it a lot. So it's totally awesome. So now I got my sale pitch down. I work in Fremont, so I'm like, can I interview you the best paper here in Fremont today? <laughs> <laughs> so um, my, uh, when I first started, there was no way I could picture myself here today accepting this award. So thanks for everybody for nominating me. I do appreciate it. Um, um, it's my customers that kept me at this work and who inspired me to do be to be a better um, vendor and that helped me with my depression. I'm happy to be a part of this community. I'm happy to see everybody smiling faces every day. So please smile at somebody today it, um, and pick up a paper from the vendor. You never know what they're going through and a smile might make their day just by saying hello. Thanks guys.
You know, I decided I might want to get a haircut because uh, I wanted to look good. <laughs> but I still can't beat John. <laughs> so uh, my name's George, and I'm a real change vendor. And uh, I'm shaking like crazy. <laughs> Um, we love you, George. I want to thank Tim for starting this thing called Real Change and giving me people that put faith in me when I didn't have faith in myself. It was people like you guys and some of you um, that, uh, come to me when I was broken hearted and uh, didn't really believe that anything was going to bring me back again. That it was just about surviving for the rest of my life. And uh, thank God for you guys. You know, like I said, you put faith in me when I didn't have faith in myself. And uh, Oh man, I'm shaking. You got it, George. Um, <laughs> you guys uh, brought me to where I am today. And uh, I am somebody today. I am a human being. There's one quick story I want to share, and then uh, I'm done. <laughs> uh, a couple years ago, I decided I wanted to go ahead and try to start my own business again in construction. And uh, I had a customer of mine and her husband that uh, we became really good friends. And she came come up to me one day and said, uh, hey, George, you know, me and Jim know that you want to start your own business, and uh, we didn't know how to help you really, but uh, we know business costs a lot to start, so here you go, handing me a $10,000 check. That's what community means to me today. Yeah. You know, and uh, one person helping another, and all I had to do to pay that back is to take and do work on their place. I got that paid back and we're still friends today. In fact, I got a key in my coat pocket to their house, you know? <laughs> I just got to promise not to come over unless I'm known or they're gone. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, George. Thank you, Sabina. And congratulations. What inspiring stories. And now it's my honor to welcome to the stage someone with a very long and deep connection to real change. Tara Moss joined Real Change in 2009 and spent eight years on staff. Tara started as a volunteer in 2000 and returned as staff to run the Vendor Center. By the time she left last year, Tara was operations director, managing the growing team and supporting a culture of caring community for our vendors. Tara today is director of LEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program, which creates pathways to healthy healing for people stuck in a cycle of arrest. She is dedicated to the work of making our city a more inclusive place, and we are grateful for her service to our community. Today, Tara will share with you why she still supports real change after all these years and how you can make a difference. Thank you. Please help me welcoming uh, Tara to the stage.
Everybody's waving to me in the back. Hi, I see you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, yes. Everybody's had their coffee. <laughs> I've been in real change for 18 years. When I started as a volunteer, I was really impressed by the constant displays of community and compassion by our community, our vendors, our staff, uh, our volunteers. Many of you are here today. Hello. I'm here to ask for your support. You know that a donation at any level is meaningful. The suggested donation is $150, but at $250, the Lucky Foundation will match it and above. You'll get an awesome book by our keynote speaker, and I have to say the best t-shirts that I've seen in 18 years. <laughs> I'm not a morning person, but I love coming to this breakfast. My people are here, my community, my vendors. Real change fosters compassion and collective feeling that we're all in this together. We've heard stories about how much the community means to our vendors, but I want to tell you a story of how important a vendor was to the community. Longtime real change vendor Robert Hansen passed away. We immediately reached out to PCC, his store in Seward Park, and PCC reached out to us. They knew that their customers needed a place to grieve. They created a space for that. I, that space quickly was filled with signs, balloons, flowers, stones, pictures, and stories. So, so many stories. There's a story of a woman who walked her dog to the store and didn't know where to put him because Robert had always watched her dog and she never needed a leash. We had a mother who said that she had to teach her three-year-old daughter what death was about because her special friend had just passed away. That person who always had a rock just for her. And then there was this, a woman who identified herself as a little old lady. She said that she was crying uncontrollably in the store. She talked about how she was taught never to talk to homeless people. In fact, she was told to walk across the street if she sees one. One day, she was shopping with a friend, and her hands were full of groceries. But her friend really wanted to buy a paper for Robert. She gave this lady the money, and the woman was so nervous to walk up to Robert. And she said immediately, he disarmed her with a smile and walked her through the process. You give me the cash, I give you the paper. Good job, you did it. <laughs> she wrote, she didn't get out much, but she did have to shop. So she did buy the paper, and she did become friends with Robert. When Robert passed away, she considered him one of her best friends. Because of that, she was crying uncontrollably in the store with other customers, grieving this great community loss. Real change created an opportunity for someone living in their truck and an old lady scared of homeless people to become good friends. And that's why I am here today talking about this. But Robert didn't just give with his heart, his smile, and kind approach. He also gave with money. Every week, Robert donated papers to other vendors. He was living out of a car, and he was still giving. When a vendor needed a little more, he'd reach in his pockets, and if he found that extra change, he'd give that too. So I'm asking you to give as Robert did, with your heart and for your community to continue relationships such as Robert at PCC. So now I'm gonna ask my table captains to please distribute pens and forms if you haven't already. You get into my, I can hear it. So just a reminder that if you donate 250 or more, Lucky Foundation will match that and you'll get an awesome book and t-shirt. Some already have t-shirts at your table. Can you guys uh, show those so everybody can really believe me when I say how awesome those t-shirts are? So, the suggested donation is $150. 
To give you an idea of what that means, $60 goes for hand warmers for our vendors who are standing outside in the cold. $600 is a vendor internship. $1,000 publishes and prints the paper. $1,000 is an annual barbecue where vendors finally get to hang out and enjoy each other's company and eat food. With these donations, you create opportunity where vendors and communities are equally important to one another. Robert was Seward Park's vendor. I love when people talk about their vendor. A connection has happened. I'm sure many of you have your vendor in this room. My kids already have their vendor. My daughter gives her money with pride to her vendor. Her vendor's here today to buy the paper. I know that she's already developing a relationship. And now, this is why I stand here as a mom with kids who consider real change as part of her community. As a Seattle community member, you may have planned to give 150. If, you're, if your situation allows, I'm going to ask you to think about giving a little bit more, like Robert. Our goal is $138,000. All of us together could give $276 each to meet that goal. Some of us can give a little less, some of us a little more. So I'm gonna give you a chance to write those donations and you can hand them to your table captain. You, if you already have your shirt at the table, that's great, but if you're gonna get a shirt and book, you can do that on your way out. And finally, I just wanna give thanks uh, thanks for your contribution to an organization that means so much to me, my family, and our community for the past 24 years. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. And thank you everyone for your donations. Our keynote address this morning is from a dedicated civic activist who works to inspire regular citizens to make their community more livable for all. Nick Licata was a Seattle City Council member for 18 years, becoming council president. In 2012, the nation named him as Progressive Municipal Official of the Year. The Seattle Weekly named him Best Local Politician twice. He has a master's degree in sociology from the University of Washington and has authored two books, Princess Bianca and the Vandals, a children's book, and Becoming a Citizen Activist, which received the gold medal for social activism by independent publisher. Please join me in welcoming Nick Licata to the stage. Thank you. Uh, being a uh, former elected public official, I'm always conscious of who's recognized and who's not. And uh, I know that we did miss some, but there's one person in particular who I worked with for 18 years and was responsible for keeping me on track, and that's Council Member Lisa Herbold. So she was, I want to make sure I recognize her. <clears throat> uh, I also want to thank and by the way, raise your hand if you don't hear me, because sometimes my voice gives out and I'm soft, so, or just yell. Um, uh, I want to thank my publisher, uh, Sasquatch Books, for providing uh, the, donating those books for those who make a contribution of $250 or more. Um, thank you for making that contribution. And if you do make it and get the book, if you have some time, crack it open and see what you think. Uh, I, um, I, wrote, I wrote this book basically because um, I believe activi activism begins by noticing things that uh, we have ignored or taken for granted, and that at some given point, they just don't seem right. It's asking ourselves, like Rosa Parks did, why am I sitting in the back of the bus when I could be sitting in front? And thoughts like that spark movements. Um, so how do we spark the inquisitive mind? 
I think it begins by questioning the status quo. Is it serving our needs, our family's needs, our neighbor's needs, and our fellow citizens' needs? And at this point, let me define citizen because, as you may know, it's become a hot term lately. Um, a citizen is anyone who lives in this country and is contributing to our democratic society. It's not, it's not just a piece of paper, and it's not running through bureaucratic red tape. And having a big bank account should not allow someone to cut to the front of the line to enter this country as a citizen. And certainly, it's not based on the color of one's skin, or the religion they practice, or whether they have a religion at all. Now, a quote from all people, the conservative Republican senator, Lindsey Graham, summed up what being an American was all about. After President Trump had finished railing in the Oval Office in front of a bunch of um, Republican leaders, sharing what seemed to be white nationalist thoughts, who would have thought? Senator Graham spoke up. He looked directly at President Trump and told him bluntly, America is an idea. It's not a race. So what is that idea? I came across a quote that's almost uh, 30, 75 years old now from Franklin D. Roosevelt's 1941 State of the Union Address. He said, the republic grew to its present strength under the protection of certain political rights. Among them, the right of free speech, the right of free press, and free worship. Then, he went on to say, as our nation has grown, as our economy has expanded, and these political rights have proved inadequate to assure us equality, we have come to a clear realization of the fact that the true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. He was adding a fourth freedom, the freedom from want. And recognizing that freedom, I believe, is at the heart of this nation's current political struggles. It goes beyond debating how many beds we could afford to provide for homeless people. It goes beyond expressing sympathy for the most vulnerable amongst us. It comes down to Americans having to decide what kind of freedoms are most important to us. Is it the freedom from want or the freedom to accumulate wealth, often without restraint? Since 1977, we have seen 12% of our national wealth as measured by the gross domestic, domestic product, transferred from middle class working families to the top 1% of the population. That trend cannot sustain a functioning and responsible democratic government. Now this is not a new debate. We've had it actually for over 100 years in this country, but I think it's now reaching a crescendo. And we're seeing it playing out in the Supreme Court and in our court system in general. And the reason we're, we are now relying on the court system is that because the other two branches of government under both political parties have already been lax and have allowed the highest concentration of wealth this nation has ever seen. Now, in seeking a path forward, I'm not necessarily talking about socialism or capitalism, and I'm not talking about class warfare. But I am talking about what a democratic society needs so that people do not give up hope in our system of government. So that citizens do not seek solace in cynicism or embrace the false security in believing a demagogue's accusations on who was responsible for their problems. And unfortunately, 
we can see that happening today. The first, with the decline of voter turnout, which hopefully will be reversed this fall. And usually those, vote, those not voting are those who have the most to lose from being unrepresented in government. And the second trend is this explosion in conspiracy theories that blame the weak and those who have the least political power. And we see them coming off the internet almost every morning. And unfortunately, too often, echoed by the White House. The effects of a shrinking middle class on the national stage are now well documented. I won't go through the statistics, but the general picture is people now are working longer hours, multiple jobs, and often both, having poor health. Our health has declined faster than any other of the developed democracies in this country, in the world. And when they're too old to find work, or be able to work, they are left with a minuscule savings set aside for retirement. For instance, the median family, the median savings for all U.S. families is just under $5,000. Think about that. And according to a 2016 survey, right, not even two years ago, 35% of all adults have only several hundred dollars in their savings account. And they are better off than the 34% who have zero in their savings account. Closer to home in Seattle, we are witnessing the decline of the middle class or the flight from Seattle and the growth of the poverty class. It can happen to anyone who is barely able to pay for their basic necessities. And according to the King County All Home website, the leading cause of someone becoming homeless is losing their job. Now, out in the hallway, we have a great exhibit of a number of myth busters that describe the population of people who are homeless. But I consider all of those wrapped up in the grand myth that homelessness is someone else's problem. For too many people, it only becomes their problem when they find tent cities and homeless campsites in neighborhoods they had never experienced them before. You know, I travel around, visit a number of cities, and Seattle is not the only place witnessing this horrendous condition. We see poverty expanding because it dominant national political philosophy says the freedom to protect marketplace investments is more legitimate than protecting the economic welfare of our citizens. If you read the literature on what a good portion, hopefully, I mean, hope, not hopefully, unfortunately, the majority of the members of the Supreme Court believe in, that's where their thoughts are. The response to this mindset should not be simply spending more money to provide social services or even affordable housing. Those are good things. They need to happen. We need to do that. But if we just go down that path of only providing services and not altering the laws, you will end up arguing about the burden of taxes and the management or mismanagement of government, which is exactly what the objections that were raised for opposing the head tax on the largest Seattle businesses in order to provide affordable housing. Even though less than 2% of all Seattle businesses would have contributed anything to that tax. That is why I believe we need to go beyond just treating the damaging effects of this dominant theory, philosophy. We must change the expectations that our fellow citizens have for our nation. So that we have a society that we want to live in and can afford to live in. A society that provides the economic security that FDR referred to. And the people in this room and thousands of others beyond this hall 
have shown that we can change our laws to create not a perfect society, but one that is certainly more just and a more equitable one. Seattle has had victories, and they have been adopted in states in both blue and red states. They have taken root because citizens realize that they have more in common with protecting the public welfare than protecting the power and the wealth of the few. Now, Seattle has begun that effort by adjusting the structure of our, of our economy so that people will gain some stability in their lives. So they have an opportunity to reach the American dream of economic independence and not, not be dependent on government. Now let's identify a few significant steps that Seattle has taken toward that goal in just two areas, improving working conditions and increasing rental security. Both have made Seattle more affordable for those who are in the middle to bottom half of family incomes. They are not final solutions, but they are real and they are long lasting changes. With regards to working conditions, we see we have set a national standard by gradually moving to a $15 minimum wage for all employees in Seattle. We listened to all sides, but we did not retreat from this objective. And as a result, thousands of lower paid part-time workers can now better manage their financial burdens. We also adopted one of the most progressive paid sick leave ordinances in the nation, which allows sick employees to stay home or stay home and take care of their sick children, still receive pay, and not be under the threat of losing their job. In the area of rental security, we passed a rental registration and inspection ordinance that basically allowed for extensive public involvement in writing it, and inspectors now will make sure that all registered properties comply with minimum housing and safety standards. This will preserve the quality of life for renters in all neighborhoods throughout the city. And afterwards, we passed a tenant protection law to guarantee that rental units are fit for habitation before a landlord increases rents. According to a 2009 American survey, approximately 10% of our rentals have moderate to severe physical problems. And to assure that both these sets of improvements have been made for the labor side, we established an office of labor standards. Without enforcement, you have no change. And for the side of rental security, we established a renter's commission. And it's important to listen to renter's concerns because what we have seen in Seattle through rising rents is that we are now the third largest homeless population in the U.S. according to Zillow. And that, by absolute number, if you were to look at it per capita, we'd be by far and away the highest. Passing these laws show we are not helpless. We do not have to wait for Congress to act. Here in Seattle and other cities, there is an urban movement to, pro to provide for our freedom from want, to stop more people from sliding into a state of homelessness. But what does it take? Persistent work, innovative solutions, and above all, a commitment to be engaged in our democracy. But isn't that why we're all here this morning? To be citizen activists? To hear that bell of freedom ring for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick, for sharing this call to action. I want to say congratulations again to Sabina and George for winning the Vendor of the Year Award. <laughs> to Jen and Kevin for the Volunteer of the Year Award, and to Karina and Susan for the Change Agent Award. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you again to our incredible sponsors for making this event possible. Thank you to the venue staff for your service today. Thank you to our outstanding vendors who are at the center of what real change is all about. Thank you to our real change staff for all your amazing work. And thank you to you. You make our work possible and you are the heart of our community. As you go about your day today, you may find that your perspective has changed a bit. These common misconceptions around homelessness that have been busted today have maybe caused you to think a little differently about our city. I urge you to share that shift of perspective. Talk to your friends, family, and neighbors, colleagues about what you learned today. Buy a paper, say hi to a vendor, smile, <laughs> and remember that we are all part of this together. Thank you for coming and see you next year. Yeah.